Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. My name is Steve Spellman. I am the uh, president of the board of the World Affairs Council of uh, Western Massachusetts, a uh, position that I am very privileged to hold. Uh, and uh, I get to work with the wonderful Cynthia Melcher, who is in the back and is our executive director. Um, I will be introducing our speaker today, and I will also be urging you to do some wonderful things, uh, such as uh, get friends to come to events like this and join the council. I want to thank our Instant Issue sponsors uh, today, Wilbraham and Munson Academy, uh, Glenn Meadow and Sir Speedy. Also, um, Ms. Jamie Kelly from M&T Bank is here, and I would like her to stand up, please. Thank you. Stand up. That's that's not saying, because she sponsored our, their bank sponsored our annual meeting. So thank you very much. I'm so sorry, I couldn't attend. No, that's all right. We had all the fun without you, so it was it was great. But thank you. All right, there you go. Uh, I want to thank Jeremy Cole, Mike Sweeney, Jeff Krasner, and Chris Cronin for doing the AEB, the audiovisual for us today. So thank you very much. Um, membership. If you're not a member, please join. Come to wonderful events like this. If you know somebody that is interested in this kind of event where you engage your mind thinking about international affairs, international relations, the things that expect, uh, affect us so much, please ask them to join. Uh, bring them along, and they'll just see how terrific uh, this organization is. Uh, and watch out for um, uh, upcoming program announcements. We haven't got anything booked right now. And um, afterwards, after Mr. Pfeffer speaks, you will have an opportunity to uh, speak with him and uh, buy his book. Uh, we're going to have a question and answer period. I will urge you again, as I always do, please start your questions not with the word I, but with who, what, when, where, how. Please explain. Please describe. It's just nice open-ended questions bring wonderful, uh, insightful answers. Mr. Pfeffer is a senior associate at the Asia Institute in Seoul and has been both a writing fellow at Provisions Library in Washington, D.C. and a Pan Tech fellow in Korean studies at Stanford University. He is a former associate editor of World Policy Journal and has worked as an international affairs representative in Eastern Europe and East Asia for the American Friends Service Committee. He will be speaking to us today with a uh, presentation entitled Right Across the World, Italy, Sweden, and Brazil. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Pfeffer. Thank you, sir. That is yours. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to see you all here on this rainy afternoon. We're going to take a very quick tour of the world. Uh, we're going to go to Italy. We're going to go to Sweden. We're going to go to Brazil. But before we go to any of those places, we're going to go to Arizona. <laughs> and the reason we're going to go to Arizona is because I want to show you that what takes place around the world in terms of the rise of far right and extremist politics also takes place here in the United States and that many of the trends that we see around the world can be traced as well to trends here in the United States. And I also want to make a kind of critical distinction right from the beginning, and that's a distinction between conservative politics and far-right politics. And although there is sometimes some overlap, conservative means to basically conserve the status quo, to maintain the status quo. That's the essence of conservative. Far-right extremist parties are not interested in conserving the status quo, they're interested in overthrowing or undermining the status quo. Exhibit A, Arizona, and Carrie Lake, who is continuing to run for governor there, even though the election actually took place and she lost, but not in her own mind. Central to Carrie Lake's campaign was election denial. Denial that the 2020 election was free and fair and resulted in the election of Joe Biden. And Denial that any result other than the victory of herself in the election in this year would also not be a free and fair election. So she is continuing to protest the results of those elections. Now, election denial, although it was central to Carrie Lake's campaign and continues to be central to her campaign as she continues to run, uh, is not what I want to focus on in my remarks today. What I want to focus on is actually something quite different. 
that the essence, I'm going to argue with you folks today, the essence of the appeal of far-right politicians, the reason why a lot of voters support far-right politicians in Arizona, in Italy, in Sweden, in Brazil, and any, many other places around the world, is for reasons of perceived self-interest for real issues. In other words, yes, there are lots of crazy conspiracy theories, including, in my opinion, uh, stolen elections, among others, and we'll talk about those today. But what I want to focus on are the perceived rational interests, perceived rational reasons why people are going to vote for far-right candidates around the world. They fall into roughly three categories. Number one, anti-globalization. Globalization, as you know, is a reduction of barriers to trade and the circulation of capital around the world to facilitate greater trade, greater circulation of goods around the world, and the removal of any obstacles at a governmental level, often regulations, government regulations. Globalization has brought many people out of poverty, especially in China. It has led to a modest increase in some wealth in the middle class, but it's primarily linked to growing inequality, economic inequality within countries and between countries around the world. Nowhere has that been more manifest than in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the transformation of the economies in that region, those countries experienced what might be considered an industrial strength version of economic globalization as their countries were prepared very quickly to enter the global economy. Now, there was support initially for the parties that supported that economic program in Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia at that time before it split. But there very quickly became a backlash. I guess that's a backlash. <laughs> a backlash against those kinds of liberal po politics. And in Poland, that was, they had a phrase to kind of express the division that kind of went through that society between those people who benefited from those economic policies, which I'm associating roughly with globalization, and those who did not benefit. They called it Poland A and Poland B. Folks in Poland A did well as a result of the economic transformations after 1990. They got new jobs, they got new apartments, they did very well. Poland B, folks who lived primarily in rural areas and small towns, older folks, folks who did not have college education, who could not speak additional languages other than Polish, they did not do as well. Poland B had their revenge at the polls, the Polish polls, <laughs> when the next elections came around and they supported far-right parties that were explicitly anti-globalization. So plank number one in this kind of rational self-interest of folks supporting far-right parties, anti-globalization, anti-global economy supporting policies. Number two, rejection of mainstream parties that supported that particular economic globalization model. Many parties of the moderate left and the moderate right supported those policies in Eastern Europe and elsewhere around the world, and voters rejected those mainstream parties. They either went to the left or they went to the right, further to the left, further to the right. And then finally, third, uh, social issues. There was uh, a backlash as well against trends that were associated with globalization. Globalization increased circulation of goods and capital around the world, but there was also increased circulation of people and of ideas, and many of those were liberal ideas, and there was a backlash against that as well. As people were angry at what they considered to be border crossers. And I'm talking here not only about physical borders, immigrants, refugees crossing borders physically, but also conceptual borders. Uh, backlash against 
gender fluidity, against transgender, against affirmative action policies uh, that benefited minorities. So a backlash against uh, border crossers or perceived transgressors. And this uh, was a, uh, these three items, these three elements, this package, if you, if you will, of economic, political, and social represent for me and my argument here, the rational or the real reasons why so many voters have supported far-right candidates around the world. Now, bear those in mind as we now go to Italy, Sweden, and Brazil. Let's start with Italy. And we chose these three countries because they had three important elections just last September and into October. In Italy, we had the surprise, or at least it seemed to be a surprise, judging from the headlines in many newspapers around the world, surprise victory of the Brothers of Italy. Georgia Maloney in a kind of neo-fascist or proto-fascist party uh, won practically 26% of the vote, and together with her two coalition allies, namely Lega, previously Lega Nord, and Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia, uh, basically took over the government in Italy. Now, I say it was a surprise, but in fact, it shouldn't have been a surprise. For a year, Georgia Maloney's party was t at the top of the polls. So anybody who was looking at Italian politics could easily have predicted that they were going to win. So that shouldn't have been a surprise. What was a surprise, however, was the video that she released in August, approximately a month and a half or so before the elections. And why was this video a surprise? First of all, it was six minutes long, and in the course of six minutes, she spoke three languages. She spoke French, Spanish, and English. She delivered it, in other words, not in Italian, which is what everyone expected, but in three other languages, demonstrating that despite the fact that she's considered an uber-nationalist, she is quite cosmopolitan in her ability to go from language to language. Number two reason it was surprising, she denounced extremism, fascism, and anti-Semitism. In other words, the very things that had been associated with her far-right party. Third reason it was surprising, she denounced the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, why was that surprising? Well, the tradition in far-right politics in Italy was actually to support Russia. Lega, the party of Matteo Salvini, had actually formed an electoral pact with Vladimir Putin's United Russia Party. There was a tremendous affiliation between far-right parties, not only in Italy, but throughout Europe, with Russia and with the United Russia Party. And we can go into that in the Q&A period why that's the case, but let's just note that here. And the fourth reason the video was interesting was that instead of denouncing the European Union, and remember, many far-right parties in Europe were deemed to be Euro-skeptical. In other words, skeptical about the European Union. She said, no, I like Europe. And in fact, my victory in the upcoming elections will make a stronger Europe. So this is interesting. I've just talked to you about some of the extremist narratives that are out there, conspiracy theories, et cetera. But here is a video in which Georgia Maloney, the head of a neo-fascist movement in Italy, basically said, vote for me because I'm a moderate candidate. Now, why did she do that? Well, on the Russia issue, after Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February, support for Vladimir Putin and Russia in Italy, and specifically among the far right in Italy, plummeted. For Lega, for instance, as I said, Matteo Salvini's party, which had an electoral alliance with Vladimir Putin. Support for Vladimir Putin fell after February from 60% to 10%. In other words, Georgia Maloney was being very practical. There was no way that she could continue to support Russia and appeal to voters in her uh, party and among the far right in Italy more generally. Well, what about Euroscepticism? What, why was she demonstrating that she was kind of a fan of Europe? Well, Italy is very dependent on resources from the European Union, especially money coming from this pandemic stabilization fund. Billions and billions of dollars, uh, sorry, billions and billions of euros are contingent on Italy 
basically being a friend to the European Union. So it is in the economic self-interest of the far right to be Euro filiac <laughs> or liking of the European Union. Um, I would argue, and this applies more generally to far right parties in Europe, they have made a decision to move away from Euroscepticism and towards what I would call Euro kidnapping. In other words, they realize that the European Union is a powerful institution, and rather than go up against the European Union, far better to take over the European Union. And that's why they have mobilized far more effectively in European Parliament elections, and why they have gradually changed their perspective toward a more uh, borough from within policy toward the European Union. In other words, I would argue that for the far right in Italy and any far right party that has any chance of having uh, governing power in Europe, the decision has been to appeal to voters' self-interest rather than embrace conspiracy theories. Now, that isn't to say that they haven't embraced conspiracy theories, they just haven't put them front and center in many of their electoral campaigns. Now, as I've said, far-right parties throughout Europe are on the march in many ways. I mean, some of them are still at roughly the same status they were prior to these recent elections in September. Uh, roughly 15% support, for instance, for Vox in Spain or the alternative for Deutschland in Germany. Some European parties, far-right parties, have done a little better. Switzerland, for instance. It looked like they might win in Netherlands, for instance. The one example, of course, of a long-standing far-right party is Fidesz in Hungary. Viktor Orban has been basically in charge of the country since 2010. And I don't want to go into depth here. In, in q and I'd be happy to talk lots about Viktor Orban. I've been following Hungary for decades. But the most important thing about Hungary that I want you to, to take away from this is that a far-right party that has taken over power has engaged in what we like to call state capture. In other words, it has captured the institutions of the state and it has used those resources to distribute to their friends and allies, their patronage system. And that is what Viktor Orban has done so effectively. And that is the future for European countries. Any European country where a far-right party has not only come to power, but has managed to remain in power over time. And ultimately, I think that is, when I talk about Euro kidnapping, the strategy for the far right, for, the Europe, for Europe as a whole. Look at all those billions of euros that the far right could have access to if it controls European institutions. But Sweden is what I promised, so now we go to Sweden. There is a lot of shock that the far right has done well in Scandinavia. I mean, Scandinavia is you know, the, the kind of home of social democracy, in some cases socialism. Uh, whenever people disparage socialism in the United States, they say, do you want it to be like Sweden? Well, Sweden hasn't been Sweden for some time. I mean, this, this country has changed dramatically over the last couple of decades. And one sign of that, of course, is the second place finish in the September election of the Sweden Democrats. Now, uh, an aside here, don't be fooled by the names of these parties. They like to put, I mean, they don't call themselves the party of anti-Semites. I mean, they call themselves something that they think will be more palatable to the electorate. So the Democratic Party is, in fact, not democratic whatsoever. It has been, since its founding in 1988, a neo-Nazi party. 18 of the 30 founding members of the Democratic Party in Sweden were actually Nazis, affiliated to Nazi or neo-Nazi organizations. They came in second, and the important thing here is they too appealed to rational self-interest of voters in Sweden. And one element of that is the economic argument that globalization has not helped Sweden that there are lots of people that have been left behind by globalization, and that the main parties of the center left and the center right have basically thrown y'all under the bus 
in order to impose this economic policy on the country. An economic policy that has moved Sweden away from the egalitarian standards of the past and has led to rather marked increase in inequality, economic inequality. In other words, a Sweden A and a Sweden B. A Sweden A that has benefited from these changes and a Sweden B, just like in Poland, a Sweden B that has not benefited from these economic changes. And just as in Poland and elsewhere in Eastern Europe, Sweden B had its revenge at the polls by voting for the Sweden Democrats. Now, the takeaway here for Sweden, before we move on to Brazil, and I'm doing this quickly and I apologize for that, but the takeaway for Sweden is this question of a cordon sanitaire. A cordon sanitaire is a red line the conservative parties had drawn between themselves and the far right. And for decades they said, we will not serve in a coalition with the far right. No matter how many votes these folks might get in elections, we will not invite them to serve in our governments. And that continues to be the case in some parts of Europe. In Belgium, for instance, where Vlaams Blog is, gets a lot of votes in elections, but doesn't serve, they're not invited to serve in parliament. Uh, but it has been broken repeatedly in recent years. Most dramatically in Austria, where a conservative party invited the far right party into a coalition government, and a kind of blurring that's taking place in Sweden today. So no Democratic Party person has been invited into the Swedish government as a minister, but this government serves at the pleasure, shall we say, of the Democratic Party in parliament, because the Democratic Party will control the success or failure of any policies that the Swedish government puts forward. Okay, so that's Europe. Italy, Sweden, Hungary. We can go back to that if you have any questions about particular countries. Let's go outside of Europe, because I don't want to make this seem as if the far right is just a phenomenon in Arizona and Europe, because it is elsewhere in the world as well. We could talk about India and the rise of Narendra Modi and kind of um, Hindu nationalism and far right extremism. We can talk about it in the Philippines and the return of Ferdinand Marcos uh, and the kind of fusion of Marcos and Duterte. But we're going to focus on Brazil because there was an election there, so it kind of fits in with this trio of countries. Now, you might think, well, OK, the far right won in Italy, came in a strong second in Sweden. Why do we include Brazil? Because Bolsonaro lost, right? I mean, he was a president for a while, but he lost. Well, first of all, he didn't lose by much. I mean, there were lots of polls that suggested that, that Lula, the previous leader of Brazil, of the Workers' Party on the left, that Lula was going to win pretty easily in the first round, and that didn't happen. Bolsonaro did well enough to force a second round in the election. And then he lost by less than 2% of the vote. Less than 2% of the vote. Now, we're familiar with this phenomenon here in the United States. When polling takes place, people are a little embarrassed. They don't say they're going to actually vote for Donald Trump. And then they go out and vote for him. So a similar phenomenon in Brazil. But a lot of people were scratching their heads. I mean, how could the Brazilians actually support Bolsonaro? Here's a guy who presided over the second largest number of, of fatalities in the world as a result of COVID. Here's a guy who promised that he would finally kind of conquer the corruption endemic in Brazilian politics, and yet he himself has been subject to a number of corruption probes that probably, and this is a guess, but probably will land him in jail uh, since he no longer has presidential immunity. How could they vote for him? Why would they vote for him? Well. Let's go back to those three reasons that I brought up at the beginning, economic, political, and social. Economic, well, a lot of people did not do well in the economy prior to Bolsonaro taking over, despite the fact that the Workers' Party handed out a lot of money to poor folks through the Bolsa Familia, the family kind of packet of money that was given to folks. Um, 
tremendous inequality persists in Brazilian society, and Bolsonaro promised to actually do something about it. And during his tenure in government, he actually increased the amount of money that was given to poor folks. Uh, increased the amount through the Bolsa, increased money during the pandemic, engaged in pretty blatant transfer of resources, not only to poorer sections of, of the population, but key segments of the population that he needed to win over. The military, big supporter of the military, and evangelical Protestants. Interesting, Bolsonaro is a Catholic, and yet, and much of Brazil is Catholic, and yet he realized that evangelical Protestants had a much greater overlap in terms of their agenda with his agenda, far more conservative in terms of social policy, made a big play as a Catholic for the evangelical Protestant vote. So appealed to people's perceived self-interest. Yes, there were extremist narratives in Brazil about stolen elections, for instance, about crazy cures for, the pan for COVID. And yet, I would argue that, again, the majority of the support for Bolsonaro came from folks voting for real things, for their own economic self-interest, because they were angry at the mainstream parties, and for social issues, which I don't really have time to go into, but we can in Q&A if you're interested. Now, Bolsonaro lost the presidency, but his liberal party, again, another misnomer, it's probably the most illiberal party you could find in Brazil, his liberal party did very well and continues to control politics in parliament, and he picked up a couple of governorships, or the party picked up a number of governorships throughout Brazil. So Bolsonaro lives on, even or Bolsonarismo lives on, even if he himself will go to jail or you know, disappear into ignominy, I don't know what exactly will happen to him, but his and a philosophy like Trumpism will persist in Brazil. Okay, that was a very quick tour of uh, Arizona, Italy, Sweden, Brazil. There are two last things I want to bring up before we go to Q&A. One, I want to return to the crazy stuff, and then I want to go for one final example. The crazy stuff. Now, I said that I think that most people are voting for the far right in countries around the world because of their perceived self-interest, in other words, for real things. But I don't want to diminish the importance of the crazy stuff, of the extremist narratives that the far right has used from country to country to, mm, to fear monger, to get people worried, to get headlines, to get the attention of the media. And I'll boil those down to three major extremist narratives. The first is the notion that there are globalists out there, a small group of people who control the global economy in nefarious ways. And those are either globalists, that's the nicest way of saying it, or they're George Soros and his friends, which is a kind of anti-Semitic way of saying things, or they're Satanists who actually engage in pedophilia and have uh, lots of small children that they use to take the blood out of to basically act like vampires. And I know that sounds crazy, but that's the QAnon narrative. And believe it or not, it's not only popular in parts of the United States, but it's po popular in other countries around the world. You would think this stuff's crazy, and yet it is remarkably popular. Number two, the stolen election thesis, which again, we're familiar with in Arizona, but it crops up in other countries as well, including Brazil. In other words, that these globalists are using whatever nefarious ways they can to hold on to power by subverting the democratic process. And number three, the great replacement theory, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. Great replacement theory basically put forward in France in, late, in the mm, late 1990s by a French poet who argued that folks out there, North Africans, Muslims, were intent on replacing the indigenous population of France through immigration or higher birth rates. And this great replacement narrative that folks out there are determined in a very coordinated fashion 
to replace the indigenous populations, primarily in majority white countries, has featured not only in the political rhetoric of the far right, but is, a, as uh, you've probably heard, has also appeared in the manifestos of mass murderers from New Zealand, the Christchurch killer, to Texas in El Paso, and some earlier version of that as well in Norway with Anders Breivik. So these three crazy narratives, why do I want to bring them up? Because I want to emphasize that they are in some sense the flip side of the rational perceived self-interest arguments that I talked about. In other words, there's an economic, there's a political, and there's a social side of the coin in each case. Anti-globalization has its flip side, the glo <laughs> sorry, <laughs> has its flip side, the globalists. The uh, stolen election thesis has its flip side of anger at mainstream uh, parties for manipulating the political process and pushing forward a economic policy associated with globalization. And then this great replacement theory has as its flip side concerns around immigration and border crossers. And that politicians in the far, far right engage in what we would call code switching. And for those of you not familiar with the term, it's when I, for instance, would use different language in different audiences. So I talk to you folks like this. But if I was in New Jersey where I grew up, I would talk to people like this and I'd use different kind of language and different kind of vocabulary because that's the way I talked when I was in New Jersey. So that's code switching. Switch back and forth in terms of accent and in terms of the vocabulary you might use. And so far right politicians will code switch. If they're in an audience where they think that they should, they can appeal with extremist rhetoric, they will do so. But if they're in a moderate audience, as Georgia Maloney was thinking when she put out her video of six minutes and she gave it in three languages, she code switched. She used the most moderate version and appeal to the self-interest of the folks she was talking to. Let me finish with one last anecdote. And let me see if I actually have time. I actually don't have time for this final <laughs> anecdote. I've exceeded this by some, well, let me do it quickly. Um, and that's Vladimir Putin, uh, who gave a speech around the annexation of uh, the uh, four provinces in Ukraine. Uh, this was um, about a month ago. And you would expect from a speech like that that he'd focus on, well, annexation. And he did. He talked about annexation, brute kind of imperial force. But he also slipped in a couple of other items that left people scratching their heads. Like, why was he talking about Satanists? He actually talked about the West as being a kind of purveyor of Satanism. Why was he talking about golden billion? Golden billion? Well, this is a Russian conspiracy theory that there is a small group of people who control the billions of e dollars of economic wealth in the world, trillions of dollars actually, and are holding the rest of the world in sway. Why did he talk about LGBT community? This is a speech about the annexation of sections of Ukraine. Why was he going on about you know, family values and men and women are the only uh, uh, only men and women should marry and uh, okay so you know the <laughs> you know the, the the narrative there why did he do this why did vladimir putin step outside of what was, should have been a straight geopolitical speech to make these three asides which very similar to the three conspiracy theories that i talked about he did that because he doesn't have to appeal to the self interest of voters in russia he's a dictator basically he can indulge in any kind of conspiracy theories that he thinks will bolster his power in Russia and appeal to the far right globally. And I'll leave you with this, because I think this is an important final political message. That is the potential future if the far right is able to seize power and maintain power. It no longer has to make appeals to voters' self-interest. It can indulge in any kind of conspiracy theories it wants to. But until that happens, we, and when I say we, I mean people who don't believe in these conspiracy theories, we have an opportunity to appeal to what I consider to be the persuadables, the folks who are voting for the far right, not for 
conspiratorial reasons, but for interest, their own self-interest, we have that opportunity, and that's the opportunity we have to seize in the years going forward. And now, Q&A, thank you very much. I'm curious to know you, uh, your thoughts on France and Marine Le Pen because you you didn't mention her, but she fits into this class of folks. Yes, thank you. Yes, so um, as many of you are well aware, Marine Le Pen is the kind of inheritor of the far right tradition in France from her father. She too has done a kind of Georgia Maloney, if you will. Uh, moved away from the explicitly anti-Semitic and neo-Nazi roots of, uh, of her father uh, and his original party, um, has broadened its appeal in some sense. Uh, but how does it fit into this broad framework? One of the major questions people had about f the results in France was how could the French far right do so well in Communist Party strongholds in France. In other words, yes, there was a kind of a, a traditional uh, constituency for the far right in France, and had been for years. But then in the 19, not late 90s into the 2000s, you started to see Marine Le Pen do much better in what had traditionally been Communist Party strongholds throughout France. So the question was, well, how could that be? I mean, a similar kind of question about, well, how did Bernie Sanders supporters in the United States in the primary suddenly in the general election go over and vote for Donald Trump? That was a similar kind of head scratcher. The way I explained it was that the far right in France was making similar kinds of appeals that the left had done traditionally and the Communist Party traditionally in France. The left in France and many places else around the world had kind of cornered the market on anti-globalization rhetoric and policy. If you remember the battle in Seattle, 1999, this was you know a, a left and trade union environmentalist kind of coalition battling against free trade agreements, the World Trade Organization, etc. The far right saw a tremendous opportunity to make inroads in support on the left by adopting much of the same language, anti-globalization language. Um, a kind of opportunism, one might say, I mean, uh, the far right is nothing if not opportunist. V Viktor Orban had been a, the leader of the Liberal Party, or a Liberal Party in Hungary, until he saw a tremendous political opportunity on the far right. He thought, hmm, that's where the votes can be. That's where the power vacuum is that I can fill. I will go over there. Similarly, Marine Le Pen and the French far right saw a political opportunity by taking over this language of anti-globalization, and it proved to be very successful in appeals to uh, what we would call France B, the French workers, French citizens left behind by the economic transformations of the 1990s and 2000s. Um, now, she happened to be end run around. <laughs> in other words, uh, she was successful in criticizing mainstream parties in France, and then only to see Emmanuel Macron come out of seemingly nowhere and make the same argument about the bankruptcy of, of mainstream parties in France. And he was able to kind of coalesce a broader spectrum of voters in France, and that's in some sense why he won, but Macron at least on this political issue of criticizing mainstream parties in France, was far more successful. In terms of uh, rise of the far right uh, sentiments, what is the role of uh, disinformation, misinformation, uh, internet, and foreign influence? Because these are the things which are coming into US realm and uh, ca causing uh, so much problem. Yeah, good question. So uh, questions about misinformation or disinformation and the role it plays. There's no question that uh, political formations that had relatively small uh, constituency prior to the internet uh, suddenly 
blossomed. Um, we're able, for instance, we know that far-right movements here in the United States, neo-Nazi movements, uh, white nationalist movements, were able to do a tremendous amount of recruitment via the internet in ways that we're previously unable to do. I mean, it used to be that the, they would send out like these ratty little newsletters and it would go out to a couple of people and they may get uh, an increase of five or 10 people per year. And then suddenly the internet comes along and it is a quantum leap in terms of their ability to spread their information around and recruit across the country. This proved to be an international uh, effort as well. And this is, I, I didn't really mention this. <laughs> I should, of course, my book. But this is what I talk about in my book, which is the strategies of the far right um, to build power. And one of the, and build power internationally, not just within countries, but internationally. And certainly the internet was one of the major tools to do that. Now, uh, the media landscape, of course, changed as well. Uh, so you no longer had just Walter Cronkite telling us the news every night. You had a variety of different possibilities in terms of um, uh, media access, as well as kind of politically inflected news. And the far right, especially you know, figures like Andrew Breitbart, saw this as a tremendous opportunity to basically smuggle in what had been fringe political views into the mainstream. And Breitbart served as a kind of um, intermediary between what, it, what were white nationalist formations and more mainstream politics. And key to that, of course, was misinformation or disinformation, because there was no better way of kind of challenging the dominant narrative, whether it was the dominant narrative of the mainstream media, uh, the dominant narrative of the mainstream parties, uh, the dominant narrative of the global elite than to spread all sorts of conspiracy theories and misinformation about those particular actors. So this is a kind of a convergence, if you will, of the internet, of a changing media landscape. And hmm, I, I, you could argue a different attitude by politicians about um, the role of truth <laughs> in, I mean, obviously politicians always have had a somewhat, you know, love-hate relationship with the truth, to put it mildly. <laughs> but we did see a kind of change in, in that in the 2000s, especially with the rise of Donald Trump, in which the occasional lie became a nonstop barrage of misinformation. So I think the, the convergence of those three trends has been a tremendous benefit for the far right. Uh, I've been interested in this uh, Stuart Rhodes trial. Um, and um, some of the uh, conspiracy theories and things that he apparently promulgated are so far out there. Um, and here's a guy who went to Yale Law School supposedly an intelligent person. And what I'm wondering is, do these people actually believe these things, or do they just promulgate them for their own self-interest? That's an excellent question. Let me take two questions. I'll try to answer them together. So I wanted to go back to when you were talking about the strategy of the right in Europe and wondering if you see uh, connections between the movements in Europe and outside and where are those connections happening? Are they grassroots? Is the media a channel for this now as opposed to direct contact? Um, and where do you see that going? OK, first question was about whether these crazies on the far right believe what they actually say. I, I can't give you a definitive. I, I haven't sat down with them to <laughs> find out what they really believe, what the nonsense that they're saying. But there is a tendency for, um, uh, for these actors uh, to assert something crazy, which they initially may not believe in, but are doing so for opportunistic reasons, and then to kind of inhabit the role that they have established for themselves. Uh, Viktor Orban is a perfect example. Viktor Orban, who made his name in 1988 at the, the 
funeral of Imre Nagy, who was one of the kind of leaders of the uh, Hungarian resistance to the Russian invasion of 1956, got up at that funeral and said, Russian troops out. Russian troops, Soviet troops out, out now. He established himself uh, and his reputation as being vehemently anti-Russian. And as part of that, as being kind of one of the new leading lights of the liberal movement in Hungary. Jump ahead 20 years, 30 years, and who is the leading kind of European supporter of Vladimir Putin and Russia? Viktor Orban. How did this happen? How did he go from someone who was so much identified as being anti-Russian imperialism to someone who's basically siding with Russian imperialism? Well, I, I would argue that at the beginning it was opportunistic, like he saw an opportunity to get Russian energy imports, for instance, at a discounted price. He could use uh, his kind of flirtation with Russia against Brussels in this kind of back and forth and trying to get concessions from, from Brussels bureaucracy. There are a lot of opportunistic reasons. But I think ultimately he came to believe what he said because it became part of a new worldview, an entirely new worldview that had the West as this kind of evil, liberal center, and Russia and Hungary as this kind of new, more dynamic, more vibrant, illiberal approach to politics. That's my guess. I mean, it turns out I, you can look at someone like Glenn Beck, who mouthed all sorts of nonsense, and then for I think about a year said, I'm sorry, what I said was nonsense, and then went back to, speak, <laughs> to spewing nonsense again. So it, it may be mental illness. It may be opportunism. It may be an actual true belief. I, I, again, one last thing on that. You know, there was some question about whether Donald Trump believed or not that the election was stolen. And when he was trying to persuade Georgia officials in Georgia to come up with some more votes, uh, did he actually believe that there were those votes, real votes, or not? And uh, you know, uh, one very convincing explanation is he truly believes the election was stolen. I mean, he truly believes it because he doesn't think he can lose anything. you know. Uh, but he truly believes it, even though there's no evidence whatsoever to back up his claims. A uh, second question was about um, uh, how European far-right parties communicate with one another, whether they are doing so kind of um, programmatically through the media and through other um, mechanisms. I mean, this is a fascinating question because I begin my book talking about Steve Bannon, Steve Bannon, of course, being Donald Trump's key advisor, who ha was thrilled about the election, the previous election in Italy, which brought uh, Liga uh, together with the Five Star Party into power, which was really the first time the far right in Italy had such power. And Bannon was like, this is the beginning. This is the beginning of the far right in Europe coming together as a whole together with the United States and with a couple places around the world as well. Bannon went to Brazil, for instance, and formed a partnership with one of Bolsonaro's sons. He went to Israel. He even went to Japan. And uh, it's a crazy story, but there's this crazy party in Japan that he reached out to. Um, his idea was all of these far right parties would work together. Um, it didn't turn out that way. And it didn't turn out that way, let's just focus on Europe for a moment, it didn't turn out that way because it turns out that the far right in Europe has some serious disagreements with one another. I mean, just look at Poland and Hungary. On the face of it, they're, they're the two governments, the what's known as Prawa i Sprawiedliwość in Poland, the Law and Justice Party, or Peace, and Fidesz, which is the Hungarian party of Viktor Orban, their domestic policies are pretty much the same. I mean, they're very conservative uh, in the traditional sense. And then they also have some extremist elements as well, uh, very much against uh, you know, the practice of free speech. They've tried to um, control the media, pack the courts, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at their foreign policy, well, there's no way the Poles are going to sit down with Vladimir Putin in Russia. I mean, you just look at the history in Poland and Russia, nah, they don't really get along. So there's, there's that serious division on foreign policy questions that divides significant parts of the far right. But there are a number of other disagreements as well. 
you see it in Parliament, in the European Parliament. There's a, there's a very far right, there's a kind of semi-far right uh, alliance of parties that try to coordinate their positions in the European Parliament. So it does take place at a certain level, very formally, between parties. There was for a period of time when Vladimir Putin was a much more um, uh, popular person in Europe, far right politicians, all of them would kind of make a pilgrimage to Moscow to get the blessing of Vladimir Putin. And that was a unifying factor. That has disappeared. Um, so now I think the, the kind of strategizing is really very concrete. How are we going to uh, take greater control over European Union institutions and determine the fate of Europe going forward? Now, I'm not saying that they can do this at this point. I mean, the far right is in power in Hungary, and in Italy it has a kind of veto power in Sweden, popular in Switzerland, unfortunately, but it hasn't really broken the 15% barrier in Germany or Spain yet. It's been outlawed in Greece. So, I mean, there are significant barriers to the far right getting more power in, in Europe as a whole. However, we do have to worry about it because strange things happen. And Brexit was certainly a surprise to me and to many people. Strange things happen in European elections. We are going to wrap up now. Could I have a hand for this wonderful lecture? Just, uh, just uh, terrific. And I uh, want to uh, give you a little gift here, which I have failed to unwrap, but there's a nice uh, candle there. So thank you for the, from the World Affairs thank Council. You. Appreciate it. Mr. Pfeffer's book is on sale. Uh, Sid is out there at the table. Uh, the book is $27, a wonderful bargain, and cash or check is accepted. And um, I also want to uh, thank Colleen and Noreen for doing check checking people in, which I failed to do earlier. So thank you, Colleen and Noreen. And uh, Mr. Pfeffer is here. He's told me he's willing to stay till 2 in the morning and answer your questions person. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, thank you very much. Thanks to the great Sid Melcher. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you.